Gilangi mat oiti, Gilangi mat oiti, Akpe trogda Gilang mangji. You know our house is our home. When ISIS came here, I heard fighting between them and the security forces. It is uh, comprehensive, it is rights-based, and at the same time it is really fun and engaging. I am estrogen. Pyarsi log mujhe esti kehte hain. And this is testo. Ab bishi ko bhaas amar kose lagu? Na na amre lagta. We said that we are going home even if that meant we had to live on the rubble because we were fed up with being strangers. My first question would be uh, about, about your way. Uh, in recent interview, Gayatri mentioned that it was accidental, but um, I I suspect there could be a connection between your experiences freelance uh, photographer, uh, freelance journalist, yes, and uh, yet covering this uh, humanitarian crisis, it's, if I'm right. And uh, uh, yeah, you, it, this text also mentioned negative bias. Uh, so yeah, could, could you tell more about uh, your, your feelings, your experience? before you uh, yeah, came to VR? To VR? Um, yeah, I think I started working um, as a journalist, always interested in human rights stories. And, and I have been then subsequently working in many different places around the world. I was working for a while in South Africa for like a German public broadcaster and um, yeah, many other places, and I was always interested in allowing other perspectives and like giving access to certain things that are maybe not accessible. And I do think that kind of like shaped the way how I then started doing virtual reality. Um, I mean, in, in the same way, but discovering the tool was for us, it was like a revelation because it really showed, hey, what we have been trying so long also works with this technology. It can really help in, in emphasizing these points we have been trying to make for a long time. Because I do think in um, there are different kinds of reporting. I mean, you know, you can do something where you focus on like more intellectual understanding of something. And I, that's that's important, don't get me wrong. And but. We also have been um, trying to get like an emotional understanding um, across. And I think that that is something we have been trying to do with VR as well. Do you remember your first uh, VR experience where you feel this how? I think that, I mean, the first thing in VR I saw was like some 360 video. Uh, um, it, it wasn't anything special, but just the fact that I could be somewhere else already like blew my mind because immediately I made these connections like, okay, if, if this works like this here, it, it will work in a lot of other places. And then I think the first uh, VR experience I saw that, that, that kind of made me think more was really notes on blindness because that's, a, a story being told in a way that no other medium would allow. So I think that's that's a like perfect example of where we are. It's like unique and powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, consider it's uh, yeah, you would still have this experience in Oculus. Uh, I remember this title in Oculus Store. Yeah, I think it's also on Arte because Arte produced it. It should be online. It should be for free and downloadable. Mm -hmm. So then what was your first work in, in with this medium? How long does it uh, take you to produce it? Mm. So the first um, work we did was um, a project from India. We were working on a documentary project on child labor and global child labor. And we um, were doing like focusing on, on a group of uh, children working in, in India. 
in Central India and it was actually as part of like some mentorship program where someone said like, hey, why don't you try this in VR? And it's like, what's VR? And then we like view a few things and it's like, okay, maybe that, that really works well. And they are the, just broadly, the story is these are children working in mica mining. So mica is a kind of metal you need for anything that's glittery. Like if you have a car, for example, that has a shiny color or, or, or like, I don't know, like, and, and anything, I'm just looking around because basically it could be anything that reflects a bit, normally has a little bit of mica in it. And um, it's really dangerous work in these mines and they normally send children in there because then they have to dig smaller holes. Um, and it's also an indigenous population in central India that get exploited in that way. There are also structural issues when it comes to this because the, the mining of mica is illegal, but this like dealing with mica is not illegal, which kind of like criminalizes like the poor people who get it out of the mines and and uh, keeps the profit for um, those who who sell it later. So we were really interested in doing that story, and that was the first time we tried VR. And oh, we at the time worked with a 360 camera. We we built a GoPro rig. Um, out of a lot of GoPros and um, took it there um, to, to, to the mines in central India. We, at the time, didn't have much experience. So we were like also kind of experimenting a lot along the way. So it was really like trying to find different perspectives. Where can we, I remember one, one mistake that in hindsight is so obvious to me that we rigged. So there, the kids were, would climb on, often on trees. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. Let's climb with the children on a tree and get, put the camera there. And then I was trying to rig this like GoPro rig on, on, on top of this tree. And like I attached it kind of to this tree bark. But now when you see it, like you realize that your head is on the tree bark. So you, you don't have a body. It's like kind of weird. Like it feels really weird. <laughs> so this, these, these are kind of like the, the, the first learnings there. But it also showed us really the potential because again, this is like a place that's difficult to access. Like we got the camera also in the mines down. And um, yeah, I think that that worked really well. Um, in that sense where what really didn't work for us, there was distribution because we really didn't like before that working with video, it's so normal that you have like a, a TV channel or, or whatever, like, like there, there's like an established web distribution, but for 360 videos, for us, it was completely new. And it's, so I think there we could have improved much more now looking at it in hindsight and in the way how um, we distributed it. Um, but that was kind of like the opening for us to be more interested in working with VR. And, and that was still 360 video. So I think later then, I think the, the next step within VR for us was when I, first experienced photogrammetry. I think that that was something that really blew my mind that I could actually walk in something. <laughs> so yeah, I think since then we have been like very curious to see what's there and try to find new, new stuff to work with. Uh, yeah, one uh, few aspects of uh, that project of 360 video. So uh, you mentioned that it was diff some difficulties with distribution, but yeah, the way you describe it, it's uh, they give you this feeling of of importance. Uh, is any people responsible for uh, yeah, for this sphere? So was it there any social impact of that work and how you gain access uh, yeah, to such uh, place where uh, this illegal issues, as I understand, not they are not so easy for yeah. workers so i mean this is i think where our work as journalists helped a lot we have a really good network when it comes to local journalists all around or especially in india because we have been working there a lot and we also worked on the issue of child labor long before we did that we did a long-term documentary project where we were following working children in bangalore some years before that so kind of knew the issue really well and we also knew the 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 I mean, that area actually we didn't know so well, but we had a very good contact there whom we knew. So it's always like this network, we have a really good network and then you have like a local journalist who knows some people there. And without him, I think it would have been very difficult, but obviously he helped us to, to approach um, 
to approach these places and and work there and it's also one of these places once you're in there like like there's no like oversight of who goes in or who goes out it's just like a big forest area um but of course that was 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 the first step really to get access and then to find the right the right people and i think another thing that we then encountered for the first time was this whole idea of like showing people what we are doing because before that like if you go and you say you film a documentary or a film like people have some understanding of what you're doing but if you do a 60 video they don't understand it so it was really like giving cardboards out there and making sure that everyone has looked in it and they also realized that i don't remember i think we had some some experience where one was swimming with dolphins or something like this that we showed to people there and they really liked that because obviously like i mean it's very nice to swim with dolphins but i realized later that probably it was like too far away from what we wanted to do to show them that because you kind of need to understand okay this is like how the way how it works but it's not about swimming with the dolphins <laughs> so um but because it was a gopro rig and not a camera that like stitches internally we also couldn't show something right away because it was at the time more complicated to stitch and it's not something we would do there on site but something we would do later so ideally of course we would have to um yeah have would have showed them something um right there and social impact of this uh, work oh yeah so um actually with this work we kind of screwed up the distribution so i think we didn't get the impact that we initially wanted because we for the documentary that i mentioned before like the film documentary where we were working in bangalore we worked with like an organization that um is basically a union for working children and we were hoping to uh, to work with them again for this but i think they didn't really understand what we were doing we were unable to properly explain that and i think we didn't get the impact we wanted and i kind of feel a little bit guilty still with this project that we that we never really exploited it to the extent that we should have so i think on on social impact it was weak but it really helped us to um yeah to get started with with 360 video and um yeah right after that i think we did a a project where we had much more impact uh in which we um we worked with another indian ngo but sorry if you have a question then uh yeah i can see that you you start to talk about ar project uh, in educational field right it's, it's interesting. no no uh -huh. not ar no 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 uh -huh. so so we have we, we did several uh 360 videos with another indian ngo um Actually, it was the same one we did that AR project with later. But so, so what we did there is they. So the first video we did was them. So we did videos before that normal videos, animated videos as well for them. And then we kind of pitched the idea of doing a 360 video, and they liked it. And so we did one. And their topic at the time was intimate partner violence. So they had the issue that there was violence within uh, relationships among young Indians and. It was difficult um, for them to kind of spot when an abusive relationship starts and like how how these things go. So we so we kind of built this narrative together with an Indian actor, where um, you are in a like the, so the camera is in a relationship with the actor and he starts speaking with you about different issues. And so it starts like. Yeah, it starts pretty soft and, and gradually goes up in the sense that in, in, in the beginning, it's about like control of money, you know, like, oh, I think you shouldn't like spend money on this. Why did you spend money there? And so, and un, until it gets like to, 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 to kind of like verbal abuse and so on. So we created the 360 film in Bombay, actually, where we, where we filmed with an actor that was really interesting to do because for the act that was the first time working with 360, which is super challenging, I think, for an actor, especially if you're alone, if you focus, if your counterpart is like this camera and <laughs> and also at the time we didn't have, because we, we are only at this GoPro, project, we didn't have a way to monitor what we would see. So we would kind of like, we had to hide from the scene and then like fully trust the actor to, um, 
to deliver. So that was, yeah, that that was a, a, a challenge. And but but it ultimately worked and was nice. And you get like nice different scenes in different areas of of, of Mumbai to make it like kind of relatable for the for the target audience. And in this case, we also got the distribution right, which. I still think is one of the best examples we have this distribution because the um, the NGO there is very well connected, so they they know a lot of like people. So we had some screenings in Bombay and different places, but the the big distribution blow was really to have a tie up with the metro in Delhi. So we managed to have, I don't remember the exact number, but I think like five stations in Delhi where we had headsets. And at, at the metro, in, in the places where like young people come from uh, like school and, and work and so on. And the catch was always say, it's five minutes, watch the film, you miss one train and you take the next train. And so many people saw it there like, because it was like, oh, we are in a, in a metro station. And like, really, like, I think this is by far the film that the most people saw that we did. <laughs> Just because I mean, it's also India, there are always lots of people. And then, <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was really nice. Like that, that was the first time where I said, like, mm, distribution can work. Like if it's planned right and you, I mean, good, it was super lucky to have also the Delhi Metro as a partner, you know, who was open to, to, to give us these venues. Um, but no, that was cool. Yeah, yeah, sounds very, very bright. Uh, but also you're yeah, trying to, to prepare uh, yeah, googling for for a threat video or whatever. Of, mm, mm, now here, media, yeah, uh, it, it's hard to yeah watch this. So yeah, I couldn't find this work, and uh, it's raised for me a question about uh, yeah, access and uh, the speed of of the films. Yeah, probably yeah. It, yes, so now you could watch 360 video on o Oculus TV. Uh, yeah, and um, what's stopping you from uh, uploading your your old works there? Is it quality issues that yeah it it would be looking uh, yeah not so nice as uh, current camera? Uh, but but in few years yeah the current footage would be yeah so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you got a got a really strong point there. So, yes, I think part of the reason that we don't have all this stuff uploaded. I mean, some of them are, but like we don't like push it and promote it so much because I do think quality makes a big difference. And I feel often when I speak to people now, and I speak about VR, a lot of them have seen some 360 video five years ago. Think this is VR. Never watched anything again. You know, and I'm like, whenever I do this, I'm like, ah, no, but it's different. Please try it. Like, this is this is something else than what is the roller coaster you saw five years ago. Um, so I guess that's part of the reason. And I think you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, that I have the fear that they don't age very well, technically. Technically, it will be, I mean, even now, like the GoPro footage looks so crap compared to like some some new 360 camera. It's like it's very difficult to to compare the two. Um, but I do think that a good story will still work. Like in the same way, how like we can watch some weird black and white movie where someone is playing the piano, and it can be boring, but it also can be interesting if the story is right. So I I think that it puts more pressure on the story because we. I think we kind of have that luxury in working in, in VR and, and AR and so on to um, to kind of rely on the wow effect, you know, like just by people, oh, I've never seen VR, oh, this is so great. And and then not be focused on the story, but more on the technology. So, but we shouldn't we shouldn't get too lazy with that and really see that we that that we get the story right even more, especially because we want this to be relevant also in five or ten or twenty years. But it will be like where, where I see actually the biggest issue there will be like platforms and like headsets, like because often you cannot even play the old stuff on newer headsets. And I don't know how that will be in 15 years, which is something that worries me a bit because in the end, will, will, I, will I need to keep like every generation of headset in order to be able to view the stuff that I did a few years ago? 
and also like the same with the stores i feel like there's no one place where you find this vr experience it's kind of scattered there's some like oculus has a good library where one can search and there's steam and so on but it's like not one place it's not so easy it's not like youtube or something like this so yeah i mean we have to see how 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 that goes let's go to a r project uh, for sex education in india was it development of a previous idea or uh, doing 360 video where you're doing uh, yes threads thread documentary to combine it or you were fascinated by technology and uh, just uh, started doing it i remember being in school and being very confused at that age around a lot of concepts around puberty, what was happening inside my body, why was I having all these feelings that I was having, and the chapters around puberty or sexual reproduction or health were skipped, even with the very limited information that were in them. I would have liked to have some open, honest and friendly information, and I think that's true for teenagers today as well. That's exactly what this app enables. It gives you the opportunity to understand yourself, to be empowered with knowledge of what's happening, not only inside your body, but also with your emotions and feelings around a challenging time in your life. The most basic difference between an AR app and a regular app is that you're interfacing with the world around you. So it's more cognizant of what's actually happening in the real world and making use of that information. We intend to provide information in such a way that it is uh, comprehensive, it is rights-based and at the same time it is really fun and engaging and it is also very, very relatable. So the characters that you would uh, see in the app, the way the information is packaged using um, interactions and games and colors, everything uh, sort of connects to adolescents and talks to them and is very, very relatable. I am estrogen. This is I can introduce myself. What we do with the augmented reality prototype is introduce a level of story into a process that's explained as a purely biological process in the school textbooks. With Love Matters, we have the perfect partners who have been working in the field of SRHR and combating taboo and shame around sex, love and relationships. Teenagers are probably a very difficult audience. They also develop differently, I guess, across male and female and across like different geographies in India, I would say. A one app catches them all is, is a huge challenge. I don't think technology or, or uh, access to mobile phones is going to be a challenge in the next five years in any part of India. We pretty much know that. So the idea is to do this pilot, do it well and to be able to show that this can be scaled up and this can be replicated anywhere. I think that was really the, um, the issue they had because we worked with this NGO before and they like several videos and they said like, look, we have, we would like to include something in the school curriculum. It's so difficult to put something in the Indian school curriculum. They are like conservative government. They will not include this, blah, 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 blah. How can we include this? And I think that's when AR came kind of into the picture, you know, like, like how can we do this? We cannot change the curriculum. We can like do a video and then try to show it in these places, but that's not the same as being in the textbook. So I think that's when first the AR idea came and we were super excited about like, yeah, why not? That's like the perfect way to do it. Um, yeah, in hindsight, I think we also learned a lot from that project. No, I mean, so it's this whole, the whole issue we had there is that we couldn't rely on our target audience to have new phones because it's like Indian school children, they don't have the newest phone. If they have a phone, they have like some old phone their cousin has and they can use it sometimes, something like that, you know? So um, so that was one issue. I think now I would use more web AR because um, I think that's really the future and, and not download some app, but like really do it on the web. But yeah, no, it was a super interesting starting point for us to go into AR. And I think a good, a good example to use AR, AR for something that you couldn't do otherwise. So it was the ordinary school books uh, you have these images there, and you add this uh, 
um, there's this layer of uh, your yeah, additional, so you could add to some extent, and there are some figures that jumps and, and audio. Uh, so could you a little bit uh, more uh, more words about uh, plot? So there is a standard school book that is being used in a lot of places in India. So we, and it's pretty old, like they use the same school book since I don't know how many years, but a long time, you know, it's, it's like a standard school book. And for AR, you normally need some triggers. So these triggers can be QR codes. This is the easiest trigger for like a computer vision to read as a QR code, but they can be also images. Not all images, some images was better than, better than others, but like theoretically you can, anything can be a trigger for, for augmented reality. And um, we, so we knew that we wanted to play like or place certain content in certain moments of the, in, in the school curriculum, so in this book. So we had like uh, these images, we knew the images and we could use them as our triggers for additional content. So the additional content like varied, it was, um, was different things. Some of them were like, flat videos that we had produced before, or some of them would be like um, informational sites from the NGO, but some of them we also um, developed for this AR app where we worked with animation and this uh, Bollywood music too. So we did a lot of like target research with the, the youngsters to see which kind of like music they listen to, which kind of actors they like, like how, how can we get them engaged in this, that it's fun because no one wants to do this this thing if it's like, and they also have some little games in there. So the idea was really like, it needs to be fun in order. That's the cool thing about actually also this NGO that their whole approach towards sex education is not, um, you know, from high up telling you to do things and not, not do other things, but really in a way that's like fun and engaging and like takes people along and yeah, makes it interesting for that, for, for that target audience. and. That was actually challenging the target audience because they like teenagers are so different in different ages. Like there are some 12 year olds who are like 15 year olds and there are some 15 year olds who are like 12 year olds, if you know what I mean. So that, that, that I found pretty difficult determining in the beginning, like, is this too childish? Is it like too, too difficult content? How do you find that? Um, yeah, that line. Uh, let's, let's go to maybe the most most known uh, yet uh, or, or i'm wrong but the work home after war is it have a lot of festival screenings and uh, awards mm, what is the story of of this work and what challenges do you have there You know, our house is our home. When ISIS came here, I heard fighting between them and the security forces. Bombs were falling from planes. We took the car and fled. We said that we are going home even if that meant we had to live on the rubble because we were fed up with being strangers. We heard that there were houses where the electricity was booby-trapped. If you see a bomb you would usually recognize it, but this stuff is new. They were my wings. So Home After War came out of the Oculus VR Creators Lab that at the time was like a kind of lab where they um, matched filmmakers with an NGOs. And because of our prior work in areas of conflict as journalists, so Guy Trini both worked in Iraq as well as in Syria before, uh, we were kind of matched with this NGO called Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining. So they are um, 
they are an NGO that mainly does policy work when it comes to demining. And we were very free in how we could approach this story, which was nice. So they work globally in a lot of different countries and we were kind of going through the work they do and through the different aspects of their work. And a lot of this is this kind of like, I don't know how to call it for lack of a term, like this traditional demining where you have like landmines that, that are somewhere that are being cleared by um, yeah, either private enterprises or, or often it's also the, the military. Um, but what was kind of new to us at, at that time was really this booby trapping of civilian homes. So that, that was something we haven't heard before. And it, when we researched it a bit, that basically only happens in three countries, more or less. I mean, it happens once in a while somewhere else, but it's mainly in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, um, where civilian homes are being targeted directly, where they put these kind of booby traps under doors or, or windows or yeah, wherever. And that kind of struck us as like a new aspect we hadn't like dealt with or heard, heard about. And also, I think for us, it was, yeah, such an extreme thing because like home for most of us is like the safe place, you know, where we, where we feel safe. And, and if, if you think about also these, um, people who have been living in refugee camps for years and then coming home is such must be such a like rewarding nice feeling but if that's kind of mixed with like this fear of like you or your family uh, getting injured or killed in something like this that kind of struck us like like the story we wanted to tackle um and initially our first idea was to really do a more traditional 360 um experience out of that and we got it together and we thought of different concepts. And then, yeah, I think more and more, we were not very happy with, with how, how, how it worked. And we were thinking, hmm, how can we make this different? Hmm. And about the same time was when we um, first met the guys from Realities here who do like these photogrammetry scans. And that, that fitted really well into the concept because it was this idea of, um, of space, like the, the home, the actual home that can be explored and that you can be there. And so we really liked this. And our initial approach was then to say like, to really focus on like this coming home. And we had a lot more gamified approach in the beginning where we thought like, oh, what is it if you come home and how you are careful when you enter a house and so on. Mm -hmm. So that was our idea before we left to Iraq. We couldn't do much research on individual characters while we were here because it was um, yeah, difficult to access. Even our local producer in Iraq couldn't travel to that area. So we knew we kind of had to wait. We got some like vague ideas, but was super broad. We waited for several months to get the permit to go and shoot in these areas. We have spent a lot of time at the Iraqi embassy here in Berlin <laughs> trying to get the right paperwork. So you know those guys pretty well. And, um, but eventually we, we, we got it all and um, we like planned our trip. We got again through our network connected to a really good uh, producer um, in, in Iraq who, who helped us to set us up there properly. Then, yeah, then we, uh, yeah, we, we, we flew into Iraq. The first challenge we actually had was to bring our 360 cameras through uh, customs at the uh, Baghdad airport. That was a lot back and forth. Uh, the good thing again was that we had a producer with good connections. So we had someone there from the ministry that kind of like helped us to go through there. And then we started working. And the, the, the main issue while working was that we had very limited times to shoot because there were these checkpoints and we were not staying in Fallujah, but in Baghdad and were commuting every day. Um, when we, we met many families there that were uh, affected and like kind of settled on, on one particular family, mainly because our main protagonist was someone who like could speak really well, where we didn't get the feeling that he was like, yeah, still traumatized to the extent others were. And, um, yeah, and that's, that's how we kind of started working with, with Amarit and 
develop the story there. And there were, I think, many challenges, like, of course, security challenges, like you always had to move a lot with the military and see when, when you had, how much time you have to shoot, where can you shoot, how long can you shoot. Also, sometimes other places, like, for example, we shot in some IDP camp, and that was not in control of the Iraqi military, but of the Shia militia. So you kind of like have to switch from being with the military to being with the militia. It's like these, these kind of issues, um, which I think we have been dealing with even before, like in a more traditional uh, journalistic way, but I think it was added with 360 because the technology takes more time. Like you cannot, like when, when you shoot documentary, you can sometimes just shoot and keep rolling and, and do things. And if it's a bit fucked up, it doesn't matter because the documentary and that's much more difficult with 360 or even with, with volumetric stuff. So you always have to set up and in a way it, it, it slowed everything down, but it also helped us to like focus on what's important. And um, yeah, I think what else to home after what was, to us, it really showed us what's what, what's possible. Then also later, because we, yeah, I don't know. It was like the first real photo. I mean, we did some test scans here, but it was like the first real photogrammetry scan we did ourselves, and and it worked. And it was like we were super nervous being in Iraq because we knew like, well, if we fuck up the scan, then like then we don't have anything. Then we just like <laughs> got here and and that's it. And we didn't know, you know, we the internet was too weak to send to send something to Berlin to to check it. So we were just like, okay, let's let's hope that's that's good. And it turned out to be good. Yeah, which was a big relief. And, and then to see the reaction of the people because we really realized that we have something there. And ah, yeah, to, to go back to this idea that we initially wanted to gamify it more. I think the reason we changed it to the storyline that we have now was when we spoke to Amait especially, but also to other people there that were affected, it was very clear that like the, like the loss of someone weighs so much heavier than this fear of coming home that we thought it would be weird to focus on this. We need to focus on, on the loss. And um, that's kind of how we shaped the story then also with Amait. And we tested a lot at the time. Also the, the storytelling we were, we were drawing a lot and having our little um, models and how to how to tell that story best. And yeah, it, it took longer than expected. There were lots of bugs and lots of issues, but we kind of got the feeling pretty early on by showing it to um, some people that we have something powerful and that it that that it's kind of working and. But nevertheless, we were not like hundred percent sure. Then we got the we got invited to Venice, which was really nice, and there we got also the chance to build an installation. Um, that was something that was really new to us at the time because we didn't work really with installations before, and we worked with um, yeah some some installation artists who actually also just graduated from university, so that we were all kind of excited, but all not very experienced. Um, which was cool in the way that 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 we got something like really cool built. Like we built this multi-sensory installation that was like big and like a recreation of part of the house and like the NGO supported us doing that. So all of this was great. But then we realized pretty early on that we like also made some mistakes. Like we we made it way too big. Like it wasn't flexible. We couldn't really transport it. We always needed a truck. Like it was a crazy, crazy thing that we built there. It took really long to put up and put down, and uh, yeah, so so that was a big learning for us. But um, but I mean, the main thing is that it that it worked and that we got really positive feedback. And then also later to show it at the UN, like we had even before we had this with the NGO, we were talking about like what's the best case scenario you can imagine. They're like, oh yeah, showing it at a conference about demining at the United Nations, and we managed that, and that was a really good feeling, you know, like. Normally when you set a goal like this, you're happy when you get here, but if you actually get there, it's pretty nice. So, <laughs> so that was good. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's also available or uh, it's a cool store and I watch it and uh, I very like this combination of uh, this VR and 360 video where, where you have 
yeah, from kind of artificial spaces and digital spaces, and then you see real people. And uh, yeah, how uh, how yeah heavy yeah this uh, to make photogrammetry uh, you you have some special technique you you get rid of the whole family from the house and make photos of every brick there uh, uh, yeah, comparing to technology yeah, what what was the uh, yeah, the balance between three sixty and uh, photogrammetry and yeah, being on a site. Uh, yes. So how, how you find this, this balance? Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, you film everything in 360 and then make photogrammetry or? No, actually, so we knew that we wanted to scan the house because the house was central. And um, the photogrammetry, as I said before, we did some trial scans before that here in Berlin. We actually scanned our courtyard, our house, and, and all these kind of things to see how to do it. And like knowing, like I, I also worked as a photographer, so I know how to take photos. And if you get your head around how photogrammetry works, yeah, back, back to photogrammetry. So I think we be tried out how that works. And I think photography helps in that if you know how a camera works, if you know generally how, yeah, how, how image composure works. And what you do is you have a system in, to take photos of a space. And I don't know, a space like this room would maybe three, 400 photos, something like this, of you really taking photo of each aspect of the, of the room. So the important thing there is in photogrammetry is always that in, that's why you shoot it with very wide angle lenses to, so that things overlap. So that in one photo, you might see one part of the bicycle behind me. And in the other one, it might be a different frame, but you still see a part of the bicycle so that the, uh, the software knows how to stitch this together. What is possible, but not really wanted in a photogrammetry scan are people because people normally tend to move around and then that doesn't work. So. So that was actually one big thing, um, learning also how you know, to find a way to explain people what you're doing, because it's a big ask, you know, to say that I want to spend an hour in Piotr's living room and he can't be in there and I'm just taking photos. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a bit weird to do that. So, so you have to like, yeah, find, find a way to communicate what you're doing. Um, and the same actually, whether it was in Iraq, also with the soldiers, like when you, when you are on the roof, they're always scared of snipers. So they normally send like two guys up with you. And it's like a long discussion I had with their commander was like, no, I can't have them there. Like they can be behind the door. I don't care, but they can, can't be on the roof. Like otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> so, so these these kind of things are like, uh, yeah, are like, are like challenging to, um, to communicate. And I think when it comes to 360 video and photogrammetry, mm, Photogrammetry, because it's not perfect, often feels a little bit artificial. So we knew that we wanted to show that this is real, like that this is not some video game we created in a game engine, but like this is a real house, a real environment, a real story. So this is, and we also knew that we couldn't do photogrammetry of all the different aspects of the story that, that, that are in there, like the, the the camp or be on the roof, be in the environment, that would have been like way too much scanning. So we knew that like, and we wanted people in there as well. So we knew that 360 would be a good option to do that. We actually, even after shooting it, even after coming back from Iraq, had a long discussion if we should keep the 360 videos in or not, because we thought like the story also works without it. But we then realized by testing it with people that there's parts of the 360 videos help people also really to connect to the place. So for example, that scene when you're eating with the family, but there was something where we had many times, oh, this was so nice. Like I felt like I'm in the house, I'm with these people. And, um, and I think one of the reasons why you're considering to kick it out is that the transition between 360 video and volumetric six, of, uh, six degrees of freedom uh, movement is so difficult because it kind of feels weird. Like initially you can move and then suddenly you're stuck and you can't move anymore. And like the whole world moves with your head. So 
that I'm still not 100% sure in how we solve this, but it, it does work, but it still feels awkward sometimes. And sometimes you have people that are not experienced with VR that will then try to walk in the 360 videos. Um, yeah, but, so that's, yeah, that, that, that combination is nice. But what needs to be, I think it needs to be clear of what you want to use which for. And and I think it's important to, in what the six degrees of freedom in the photogrammetry environment allows is that people have agency to move and feel like they do something. Whereas like 360 video is much more passive where you're there and you're really like just viewing. Uh, recently, you have a premiere at Tribeca Film Festival, uh, a Kus Kusanda project, if I'm mm -hmm. right. And uh, i fascinated uh, yeah, by the trailer and the description that it has a speech recognition. Uh, yes, this project about language and speech mm -hmm. recognition. And uh, it seems that you have there only volumetric uh, videos. Uh, and some photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. So was it, uh, what's the relation? Does it solve your uh, issue, issues that you mentioned uh, with home after war? Uh, do you feel it's a uh, next, next uh, level of, uh, of the yeah. medium? I think Kusunda is kind of a progression in what we do. I think in Home of the World, really like, like photogrammetry environments and how to combine them. Um, in Home of the World, just to, I didn't say that before, the character we filmed was a stereo camera against a green screen. So it's like a stereo billboard. And that looks actually quite well, but when you get close to them, you see that the person is flat. So it's not a 3D. Uh, character, but a 2D character that you place in a 3D environment. And um, and yeah, with, with Kusunda, we wanted to have like our protagonists um, volumetric. So we were combining uh, a depth, uh, Azure depth kit with, um, yeah, with, with, with a camera. And that's how, how we got like a simple depth kit image or a simple depth image of, of, of the character. In some ways, it was a progression, of course, like a lot of the learnings we, we took. But this piece was different because a lot of it was very heavily based on animation because a lot of the things we wanted to show no longer exist because the, uh, it's like this past of them living in the forests is something we couldn't show anymore, not with a 360 camera, not with photogrammetry. So we really relied on animation. and. We also had some more constraints in some ways that we knew that our character was our main protagonist is, is like an old man and we couldn't make him stand so much. So he would have to sit anyway. So we knew that it's going to be a sit seated experience, not something where you can move around so much. Also, the, yeah, the story doesn't demand as much as in Home After War. In Home After War, like you moving around in the space and yeah, feeling like how they feel coming home is very different from um, from Kusunda where like the photogrammetry environment is more like the the opening to these worlds in 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 the past from our our protagonist um, there we were working on a very co-creative model so we were speaking a lot with the community on how to do that best and I think that the speech recognition is something that also came from them because the idea was really like, can you show solidarity to their struggle and learning this language and preserving this language by the kind of like speaking the language. And we were super excited about the idea. And initially we, we thought we can like do it ourselves. We get like some people working with AI where we try to see how we can do speech, speech recognition. So the first issue we encountered was that any kind of artificial intelligence relies on big data sets. Now, a language with only a handful of speakers has like zero data sets. So we needed to kind of create big data sets. So we asked people to speak the language. We had like an online companion. We asked people to say words, but was still by far not enough. So if you, I don't know, if you have Siri or, or Google Assistant or something like this, and that sometimes doesn't work properly in English where you have 
gigantic data sets. I don't know how good it is in Ukrainian, but I could also imagine that Siri is not very good in Ukrainian because, because normally it, it relies on like these big data sets. So in Hebrew, we're trying to do that with like this like language that almost doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so, so we tried really hard to, to, um, to build this AI and we did build it, but it didn't work as good as we wanted it. So then we were kind of back to square one again and not sure what we do. do. And then like um, one of our developers had the idea to tweak the Microsoft English voice recognition to work with Kasunda. And that surprisingly worked quite well. So this is it's actually initially we did our own AI didn't work. And now we rely on Microsoft, which is also a bit sad, but that's just how it, <laughs> how, how, how it worked in the end. Um, but yeah, I think it's an important part of the story like that, that you speak the language and in Kusunda, what we also did for Tribeca and I think which is like something that got me excited a lot was that we integrated it in an installation. Um, and in the installation, you have some kind of social interaction even before you put the headset on. So we had like cards for people where they would ask each other. So four people went in at the same time. And before they put on the headset, we would have like a kind of like conversation among them where they could speak among each other. And I think that was really nice because this transition from like the, yeah, the, the, the real world to the virtual world is something where yeah, but, which is important to get them in the right mindset before they even put on the headset. Gilangi mat oiti, Gilangi mat oiti, Akpe togda Gilang mangi. Obera gema, Kani. Bosni, Kani, Pini Kurunja. A basic of Hasamar Kosalari, non omnis lacta. I'm not pass about Bonapaji, the break them, non sunukurunto. कुसुन्डा भाषा र हैन भने चाहिँ किन नेपालमा कुसुन्डा छ भन्ने पनि अस्तित्व रहदैन यो कुसुन्डा भाषा संस्कृतिलाई चाहिँ एकदम पनि बचाउन सक्छु भन्ने चाहिँ मलाई एकदम पनि आश छ आठ पनि छ है Yeah, it was my question how you yeah, teach teach uh, uh, AI uh, to a language and uh, so is it uh, some pronunciation of of that language is close uh, to English pronunciation uh, or so you get back from uh, from the speech recognition you have some text yes and uh, it, and it's kind of that original language uh, or, or is uh, artificial intelligence a way to to save a, a new language? And mm. I think, I mean, I think the AI also changes the language because as I said, you need like, like everyone speaks a bit different. And if you say one Kosunda word, even between Kosunda speakers, it's different. But if I say it and if you say it, then you say it with a Ukrainian accent, I say it with a German accent and we kind of like, like change Kusunda as a language because that's what we feed into the data, yeah? So um, I always liked that idea because I feel like language, like people think languages are very pure, but languages change all the time. Like you and me don't speak in the same way like our grandparents spoke. So languages evolve, languages change. And so in that way, I was fine with like some changes to the language. Um, but I think it, 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 it just took too, too much data for us to really rely on, on, the, on the data sets in order. So we based it, it's this Python based. So Python, I don't know if you are familiar, but yeah. a, so that's, that's how the AI was uh, created, but it didn't really work. And then in the end, we used the, the, the Microsoft AI and that, that did work. 
Uh, you have a project speak to a vacan. Uh, it, and it's connected to Kusunda, uh, or it's a different uh, yeah, to, to, to save uh, other uh, disappearing languages. So, what yeah. about? So, when we started out working on Kusunda, someone like, and first of all, a lot of people said, like, oh, wow, interesting that you're doing that. I don't know. I'm from this region. In my region, people speak this language that's also slowly disappearing, or, you know, like, my parents still speak this um, dialect that I don't speak anymore. Or, so a lot of people felt connected and we felt like, okay, this is really a global issue. It's not just like this one thing in Nepal, but it's really something that's happening all over the world. And um, so we were interested in this. And then someone told us, hey, there's this artist in Taiwan who does something very similar to you. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Let's speak to them. And then we started speaking with them and it was really nice to see that someone else in a different end of the world is also doing some, some VR experience about a, a language. And then we said like, why don't we work together and try to create a series where we can have different episodes that like showcase the same issue in order to, um, yeah, to, to show how global the issue is. And that's how Speak to Awaken the series came. And like, these are the first two episodes and we hope to do more episodes, but obviously that also depends on, um, on funding and on also on finding people from these regions that want to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I remind that uh, two years ago at ITFA, there was a, a VR work by Lena Herzog, uh, AS about uh, mm -hmm. the missing languages maybe. Uh, maybe we could have to cooperate with her. And uh, my last uh, question. Yeah. Uh, is mm, you also, if I'm right, you uh, you, you are professor, docent, uh, professor in the University of Applied uh, Science, mm -hmm. uh, yes, in Berlin, and uh, yeah, from this point of view, so you work of, with students, you 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 share your knowledge, and uh, what is feedback uh, from from the students and uh, some. So, uh, yeah, as an academic, as a person from academia, probably you have yeah, this uh, perspective, some side on the perspective, and how it changes uh, young people uh, and this continuation of uh, and development of it. So, any insights that you have from uh, academia? Mm. So. Yeah, we teach in, in the university and also in a few other workshops and, and uh, film schools and so on. And normally they, they take us as, as a kind of like expert from the like practice field. So the first challenge there is always that students are on very different levels. So there's some, some students who have seen VR, some students know about VR, and some students don't even know what you're talking about. So that was like the first thing we had to, we had to see that, that we get everyone on one level. So we normally do some like practical workshop where people can first see some stuff and experience some stuff. Mm. And I think from a very selfish perspective, what I learned in all these uh, teaching or what really helped me with teaching was that I realized that over the years, you learn certain things because we try, because we are so much, there's no like school book you can open and see like, oh, this is how you edit something or this is how you do something. So we try and fail and this doesn't work and that doesn't work. And then you know, sometimes you find something that works. And, but you never formalize it. You never like sit down after a project. I mean, maybe we should, but you never like, we're probably too lazy for that to actually sit down and write down like, oh, this work, that doesn't work. But if you teach it to students, then that's exactly what you have to do. So in, in that sense, I really liked it because you, you're really forced to like formalize the knowledge that you have in, um, in the field. Mm. Yeah, I, I think generally, like when there's not much academic research in, in VR, but there's some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, on a side note, like uh, I'm really like um, like interested in the work they do in Stanford at the Human Virtual Interaction Lab. So, so they do really good school stuff. It's really interesting. That's yeah, I think that's it's a very new field. The, the problem that academia always has is that the processes are so slow. Like to like put something in the curriculum 
takes so much time by that time, like everything has moved on and it's already something else. Yeah, if you know what I mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said that it would be a last question, but now you haven't. Uh, do you have any insights and new thoughts after Tribeca or yeah, from last time? Where, where do we go with this uh, with it all? Yeah, so we actually, it's not official yet, so don't publish it yet, but we're going to be in the best of selection in Venice, the Venice Biennale. Um, yeah, we have some, we actually also shown in Taiwan at the Kochung uh, Film Lab. And um, yeah, I think there's several festivals that are coming, coming up where we still haven't heard, but normally, Normally, I mean, what, what I can say from, from home after war is like once you have been one of the big festivals then a lot of other festivals come. So I'm pretty sure that we will have a good festival run. And after that, we really want to bring Kusunda into museums. I think that's, that's a, a, a big part of our focus. And um, what was almost as important to us was also to show it in the community. So we already went to Nepal to show it to the community there and that worked really well. So that that was kind of our yeah our main audience we were worried about because it needed to work for them. So <laughs> so that was good that we managed to do that. <laughs>